before we begin, I'd like to give just a round of applause to Peter Gracie of Quota Factory. Thank you. So, we're going to talk about sales culture, but before we do that, I want to know a little bit about yourself, what you're up to, what you've done in the past, and one interesting thing that you'd like to share that we may not know about. Wow. So I'm Pete, I'm CEO of Quota Factory. Um, for the last 14 years, I'm dating myself. I've been in the outsource lead gen space um, as CRO and founder, uh, co-founder of a company called AG Salesworks, which some of you work there. Uh, Lang, talking to you, wherever you are. Uh, and some of you may have heard of. So now we've, we've made a, a switch um, in our business model where we still do the outsourcing side of the business, but we, we also uh, built a software platform that essentially productized that 14 years of sales development expertise. So we're selling SaaS and we're selling services right now, so it's an exciting time for, for our company. Um, very proud of our sales development and sales heritage uh, as a company, very proud of the, the network of alumni we built locally here in, in the Massachusetts, the greater Boston area. A lot of familiar faces in here tonight, which is very cool to see, except for Ryan from Inside Square who bailed on my talk. He used to work for me, so he'll pay for that later. Um, interesting fact about me, there's so many, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to pick I, just I'm, one. I'm, I'm not getting a lot of confidence on that, okay. many parts. Uh, well, there's a few. Um, I would say, so it's not, it's not that I have my LinkedIn photo is seven years old. That's not an interesting fact. <laughs> I would say, I, 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 I well, that was semi that. more recent, that's like five years old. Um, anyways, I think today I found out something pretty interesting about myself. I don't know if you noticed, I got pretty fresh new haircut. Uh, this occurred today. It's the boys regular from Supercuts. <laughs> um, and I was, uh, I was in the chair and, and the nice young lady, her name was Andy, um, having conversation and she's, she's doing the back of my, my hair with the clippers and she's grimacing and making all these kind of painful faces. And I was like, starting to get offended. You know, my hair's not that bad, whatever. What's your problem? And I said, is everything okay? And she's like, this is, all the weirdo alarms are gonna go off in the room right now, I can tell, but she, she said, do you know you have seven different cowlicks on the back of your head? And it makes cutting your hair really hard. I think it would be easier if you went bald. <laughs> so the interesting fact, if you wanna pull it out of there, is that I have, I have seven cowlicks on the back. You, you glad you had me in? <laughs> yeah, uh, our, our next uh, speaker this evening is, uh, is Adam from Spiro. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I really don't know where to go from that. But, uh, yeah, we talked about a couple different ideas for the chat this evening, and the topic sales culture really came up at, over and over again. So, why are you passionate about it? I think, well, my, my career, I, I started in the hotel business, which was terrible, um, and took a sales job in the, the late 90s because I had a lot of friends that I would deem, you know, not smart, who were making a ton of money, uh, doing really well in sales. And so I've been in sales my whole life. Um, started a company that, that was focused on supporting salespeople. And what I've learned, you know, 13 years, 450 unique engagements with different companies, is that um, the sales team is really an afterthought uh, when it comes to setting the tone and the, and the tenor and managing your corporate culture. And I, I find that to be really frustrating. Because you, you typically hire salespeople because they're great at what? Communicating mm -hmm. and listening. Yet you don't involve them at all in building the, the, the culture of your organization. So that's the high level reason I'm passionate about it. Uh, you know, the more personal reason is that, you know, probably in 08, late 08, we lost 40%, I don't want to, do you have tissues in case I will up? <laughs> this is an emotional story. Um, Ed, you'll be all right. Ed was with me during that time, so was Chris. Um, we lost, I, I think, probably 35% of our revenue in a day. Um, and we, we had to let go of 30% of our company the next day. Um, this was in 08 when, when everything kind of hit the fan. And um, we had to cut key employees, really these seven or eight wonderful people that worked with me for, from the beginning. We had to cut their salaries by 20%, no bonuses, all the terrible stuff. Um, and at the time, it, in my life, I was going through a terrible time personally. So not only was the business failing, but you were experiencing personal failure at the same time. And it took us the better part of two years to climb out of that. 
Um, and it's really safe to say that I probably didn't help out as much as I should have because of everything I had going on. And I looked back when we, when we got out of it and I said, you know, I, I looked back and these seven, eight fantastic people were still there. And I learned so much through that terrible time that I knew I owed it to them and myself to really sit down and say, it's not about me. There was something greater at work here in this organization that's beyond their friendship with me and their loyalty that kept them pushing through and, you know, excusing, excuse the language, you know, shoveling untold buckets of shit for a two year period right. to get that company out of uh, the grave, if you will. And what I realized is that it was the culture we had created amongst ourselves. It was the, um, the camaraderie, the, the effort we made to um, understand one another and understand um, how the company needed to behave and act in order for us to be successful no matter what. So um, long-winded and, and emotional, so we'll, we'll try to keep it a little more upbeat, but that's why it matters to me because I wouldn't have a business today if, I, if my team hadn't created that great culture back then. And so you know, we, <clears throat> we talk about sales culture, and I think people have different perspectives of what culture really means. So what do you think are salient points of what is culture and specifically a sales culture in and of itself? I think a, a culture as, as defined for, for me is, is um, the core values and the personality of any organization, right? That, that's a very simplistic but very uh, effective way of defining it. You know, it's, it's what you value as an organization and how that manifests itself in the personality that your company pushes out to the world. Um, you know, our core values are respect, engage, perform. And when you interface with our organization, uh, you, you feel like you, you enjoy working with the people that, that uh, you're working with because they're showing you respect in everything they do, that they do. Every engagement you have with them makes your life slightly better. Uh, and most importantly, they hit their numbers, they perform. So that's what culture means to me. It's the, it's the, the core values and the personality of your company. And if you think about companies that maybe you've used as a vendor and it wasn't a great experience, if you really peel back the onion, uh, you know, unless their product just sucks or, or you, know, um, you know, they didn't deliver anything, if, if they did their job but you still didn't want to work with them, culture was what drove your decision to not pay them anymore because that's the personality that they kicked off to you. So, probably have a good sense of what a good culture looks like. Yep. But there's a lot of talk about bad sales cultures, and it's kind of interesting. I read this book by a friend of mine, Mike Weinberg, the yeah. new sales managers. Yeah, the um, sales management simplified. That's right, sales yeah, management it's a great simplified. Book. And uh, he talks a lot about sales culture and a lot of the bad sales cultures he's been in. Yeah. What have you experienced? Fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But fun from reading perspective, but when you're in it. Not fun to work in it. Not, not, not fun to work in it. Uh, have you seen like, a bad sales culture or things that you've seen just weren't great? Yeah, I mean, 450 engagements. I've, I've walked out of companies wanting to just light the building on fire because the sales culture was so bad and the things that would be done to people. Um, we're, we're so terrible. I try to, I try to break them down. We, we categorize them, right? So I can think of one guy locally. We call it, um, call it the gladiator pit mentality. So this, this, I guess the, the term today would be this guy was a, a real hardo. He, you know, he came into this organization and he had he had a certain way that he wanted to structure the, the sales team. He hired the same guy. You know, there there were no um, no women on his sales team, which I think is a you know, a red flag right out of the gates that there's right. no diversification there. But it was the same guy, former college athlete, um, very competitive. And what, what this gentleman did, his, his philosophy was no territories, no ownership of leads. Right? So just this big, like, I, I don't know what a, uh, I'm terrible at analogies, and you probably hear eight or ten terrible ones today, but um, imagine just this big bowl of popcorn and ten people trying to eat out of it, or a small bowl of popcorn and 10 people trying to eat out of it. So right out of the gates, it was dog eat dog. Right. Then they got, it was a pretty hot technology. They were getting a great amount of MQLs. So they had a round robin, right? So uh, Mark, you get a lead. It's a good lead. You have 24 hours to get that opportunity live on the phone and book a demo. If you do not book the demo, it goes back in the pool and the 24 other reps start calling 
that same opportunity. Um, I bring this, this one up first because, I mean, that crash and burn would be, uh, it would be a really kind way to describe the, traje the trajectory of this guy's sales team. Um, so Gladiator Pit was a bad one. Um, Scarlet Letter, classified one as that. Um, that's all about shaming. You know, the, this, this VP of sales, every morning they would have a sales huddle and the only document that would be, dis or the only item that would be displayed up on the screen was uh, the previous day's lowest talk time. <laughs> and he would spend an hour every morning dressing down the five worst performers from the previous day. Right? So you're like, I don't know what mom and dad have to do to you growing up in order for you to <laughs> want to engage in that on a daily basis. Like, that's terrible behavior. So that's how they would start their day. So you're, you're shaming the low performers at the expense of the high performers, where you, you should be acknowledging the people that performed the way they needed to perform the previous day. Um, and then the last one we classified, we were going back, um, doing an, an analysis for a project we're working on. We classified it as um, enemy of the state. So this, this VP of sales got a job, ended up being wildly successful and exiting. So I'm going to criticize him, but you know, whatever. He's laughing at me. So um, his philosophy was it was us against them. He came in. Within his first week, he had had a shouting match, a strategic shouting match with every department head in the organization. So VP marketing, uh, HR, finance, maybe the CEO, I don't know. But he dressed down every leader in the, in the company to assert his kind of dominance, if you will. Um, and then uh, in every meeting, uh, he would start the meetings, their, their weekly sales meetings, by uh, asking his team who in the organization was getting in the way of their success. So I hope that illustrates, I mean, we've seen, I mean, I, I have some, some friends in the room that, that I've worked with for a while. We've seen some really bad stuff over the years, but those are three terrible examples. Yeah, the last one particularly reminds me of a company that, uh, a, a big uh, company in the database and application space that starts with uh, the letter O, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was a perfect example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And good dressing down to yeah. start the day. That's always what you need. But you know, we could spend a lot of time on the bad. But I think what most interesting is like, what's good. Like, what What would you say is the foundation for a really great, solid sales culture? And where does it start? I think I think it starts with that establishing those core values of your sales team. Right. Well, companies should be doing this anyways, but. You know, who are you? What, you know, what matters to your sales organization? It obviously, it's about the numbers and achieving success financially, but people today, it's not just about that. And there are, there are things that you have to establish um, and, and push forth as things that matter to you culturally with your sales team um, that are going to ensure that they hit their performance metrics. So it all starts with, with establishing your core values. Like I, our, I said, ours are rep, we call it, REP, respect, engage, perform. But uh, does that, would that differ from the overall corporate values? I, you know, I'm beating a drum, I'm starting to beat a drum tonight uh, about the, how organizations should be creating their, their corporate culture within the sales function first and allowing that to be the organizational culture. Um, you know, I think if you, and I'm, I'm sure we'll end up talking about it at some point, but if you're onboarding the right people and they've got sales skills and they're capable of selling, there's no better type of person um, to engage within your organization to develop a, a positive culture. So I, I, I mean, I, I think it's the place to start. You shouldn't differentiate. You know, create your culture, create your core values, establish them within as a beachhead within your sales organization, and let them do what they do best, which is communicating, listening, and advancing relationships around your organization to push your culture forward. Now, it's interesting, Alex, because like the sales function is the most outward, outgoing of yeah. the fun any function organization. So yeah. it's kind of interesting when you think about it as an outward push. But you're talking about it as kind of an inward push into the organization as well. Yeah, I mean, how many, how many organizations, how many people have worked at organizations where the sales function was uh, looked at in a negative capacity by the other departments in the organization? Fair, Fair, you know, one or two, pretty much everyone. And so how illogical is that? These are the people that represent your company. They're the, they're the first point of attack with a, a potential customer. 
and they're not engaged at all in who you are as an organization. In fact, they're kind of, they're like, they're on a little island. You ignore them and you don't really, um, you don't really challenge them to be part of that. Yeah, and it's, I see that you know, particularly more and more prevalent in a lot of startups that where there's a, a kind of a right out the gate a negativity towards the sales organization. Like, oh, I got to hire reps now. I don't know. And, and you just all, right off the bat, it starts off in a very bad way. Yeah. Like, you see it all the time. I mean, that's usually, sometimes that's at the founder level, you know, where uh, they might have had a bad experience with a sales leader or a sales team over at a certain period of time. Um, but yeah, you see it all over the place. So, you know, obviously you mentioned hiring, like bringing the right people in. That's such a huge component of actually building a culture. So what, what do you think about in terms of hiring and hiring for sales? Because I think a lot of people have this big question, like what do you hire for, for sales? What's really important? And, yeah. and how do you see that actually driving culture? I, you. The first order of business is that you, you have to understand that you're hiring a salesperson. So establish that they want to get into sales, right? <laughs> I think that's like the, it's the most ridiculous thing. A lot of interviews, there never comes up the question of, well, why do you want to get into sales? Um, you know, music to, to our ears is you ask that question and they say either mom or dad had a career in sales. That's a leading indicator that that's probably a decent candidate. They're motivated sure. by, by things all other than um, compensation. Um, I keep hiring of anybody super, super easy. All right, you hire based on work ethic, character, and intelligence, and tolerability. All right, not whether or not you. Yes, that's the key. That's the key word here, right? So can can you do the job well? Can I train you to do the job well? Will you enjoy it? Will you enjoy doing the job well? And can me and and my coworkers tolerate working with? You know, um, and I learned that the hard way. You know, I created, um, you know, and, and like I said, there's, there's friends in the room, created a situation where I absolutely loved everybody that was working for me, but 70% of them weren't hitting their numbers. So, you know, it, it, it ends up in a bad way. It has to be more about whether or not they're smart, they're gonna work hard, um, and, and they're of high character. And if you could sit next to them and not, you know, stab them with scissors or something like that, you know, they're tolerable to right. work with. Right. It, it's kind of funny you mention it because yeah, I've seen these, uh, this, well, I call them cabals. Some people may call it a little bit different, but where you see uh, it's a little bit of a buddy network, and they move from company to company. It's because they all like each other, but the reality is that there's really a bunch of folks there that just aren't Why they that great at sales. Yeah. And they just they all like each other, right? Yep. We need to get away from this idea of like likability as a means or measure to, as you said, tolerability. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I have a lot of friends that you, you might meet and not like. So I, I can't bring that into work and, and make sure that, or, or make that part of my hiring criteria. It's just about whether or not they're the right fit, work ethic, intelligence, character, and can you tolerate working. Yeah. I want to touch on something you just mentioned uh, previously, which was, sales compensation, the motivation around money. Right? I think you know, we can all agree like money is a, an important factor if you're in sales. But who doesn't care about money in this room? Okay, good. Just want to establish. I, I just want to make sure everyone here is actually in sales. But I mean, in all seriousness, we, you know, everyone talks about money and compensation is driven around money and all that. But yeah, I've heard a lot of conversations that maybe there's other motivators, maybe there's different ways we're thinking about motivation. Maybe, maybe we've done a disservice by making it all about the money from a sales culture perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to say it's a bad thing. I mean, you, you definitely, you want money motiv motivated individuals because sure. they're trying to help you attain your goals. But I've always, I've always operated with a really simple mantra, and it was when I was an employee, and, and then when I was running my, my own team, and then my own firm, is that you, know, you, you should require um, that your company thanks you for going above and beyond what's asked of what the average person is doing, pays you more than the average person for consistently going above and beyond what's asked of you, and promotes you faster than the average person for consistently going above and beyond what's asked of you. So, Thank them, pay them, promote them. And, and that, you know, again, 
I think in threes, you know, I do math at a third grade level, so you know, I gotta, I gotta be, you know, nice and easy here. But that's what we've always lived by, right. and that's because people aren't just about the money. They want the praise, and they want the the career advancement. The younger generation that a lot of you are managing now and some of you are, are in the room, um, there's even more to it than that. There has to be a quality of life. I've never seen a generation where that's as important as it is now and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, relating to them and the issues that they're facing, it, you know, there's a unique requirement there. But thank them, pay them, promote them, stick by that. You run your company like that, you run your sales team like that, you're, you're guaranteed to have a fairly decent culture and a lot of people that that are, are pretty happy to work for you. True. I think part and parcel of that is when you start to bring people in to an organization, it's you know making sure that everyone's kind of on the same page. So what have you kind of done from a maybe a sales training or onboarding perspective to you know, not just focus on, on the skills or the product or whatever, but to really focus on the culture and making that kind of a central component yeah. of getting everyone up to speed and integrated to the organization. Does anyone use mentors for their new hires? Does that work? Yeah. You guys in the back? How's it been received? <laughs> um, was one of you the other's mentor? Sorry? Was one of you the other one's mentor? Oh. <laughs> um, I think it's working okay so far. There's more structure to it. Yeah. But the, the BDRs that are a mentor want to be a mentor. Which is usually a good sign. Exactly. Do you have performance requirements around that? Like do you, Tier, our fear is just tiered, so okay. it depends on what tier you're in, and you're, you know, all of them will be in So tier three is an advanced tier, and okay. Right. So that's, that's great, I mean that's step number one, establish a mentor program for your entry level salespeople. And it's gotta be more, more than. More than the ride along? Yeah, hey, I, I wanna introduce you to everybody whose names <coughs> you're gonna forget in four minutes here. Um, <laughs> and then I'm gonna take you out, you know, to a two beer Thursday lunch and then Tell, tell the boss you drank at lunch. You know, it's not, that's not an effective mentor program. So um, that's, that's the first step. Because it, what I found is that a lot of companies are really dialed in the, the training content, the onboarding content. But yeah, it's amazing. Like, it, it, that you put someone, we were talking about this before, you put someone on, on the phone trying to have business level conversations with prospects, and they've had one week of training. Yeah. I don't know. We've been doing it for years. But we should stop. Yeah, but it, if you do it right, you can. You right. know, if you if you if the training is focused and, and aligned with what the goals of the job are. Yeah, but all I mean, you've seen like some, you've probably seen some really bad training, right? which is all about product. I've, I've, I've <laughs> training is one of those areas. Onboarding is one of those areas. It's either it, it, there's no in between. It's either pretty good or great, or there is none. And it's your training is I've directed you to your desk. I have talked to you for 10 minutes about what our product does, and now you have a list. That makes it false. So, um, there, there was a question over here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when you have a mentor, do you set up certain modules to teach the new employee, or is it more just an advisement or advisor to your day to day work? Okay. So, questions uh, you know, what type of structure is there some sort of advisement around the mentor mentoring? <laughs> Yeah, or is it module set up? Or module set up. Or are they doing training? Um, yeah, we, we recommend that the, the training is modularized. Does that work? I think so. I give you Yeah, that. all right, yeah. thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, you're, you're good. All right, good. Thank you. Um, we recommend that you do do that. You know, uh, small bites over the course of that week. In our case, some companies do 10 days or some companies do a month, whatever it, whatever it is. But um, you don't want the, men, the mentor doing all the work. Our philosophy is, is spread the, the modules out across the entire organization, right? So when we talk about how does that dovetail back into your culture, you're exposing that, that new individual in a very short period of time to a lot of different people in your company. And those people know exactly what they're responsible, what knowledge and, and expertise they're responsible for imparting to that person. <clears throat> in my experience, mentorship is great. The issue of, and especially with large organizations, is that the mentor has the, they, they have their job. Yeah. They still have the deliverables, and uh, the better they get, the more mentees they get. And, and how do you balance? You know, they're they because they're probably good at what they're doing, and you yeah. need that. Versus. So the question is, 
how do you ensure that the mentors are able to do an effective job when they're also doing their day in day out job? One way is to comp them on the performance of the mentee in that first month on the job. So um, that that incents them to not only accomplish their own objectives, but there's a there's a way to make additional cash based on whether or not that person hits the phones and performs well in that first month. Um, one of the other things I alluded to is don't make the mentor, mentor's there to guide. They're not there to do all the training. So you've got to spread that, that responsibility across your entire team. Um, if it's a really small team, they're gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> you know, that's the life of, they're, they're in early, they're probably gonna be uh, the person that you might promote to manage that team at some point, so they need to step up and do the extra work. Good question. When you're hiring or in training, what is way more, uh, product knowledge or sales knowledge? Uh, what's more important in, what is important when you're doing training? You know, what do you do today for training, for example, and what do you think really matters? I think, that's a great question. I, I think from a, a training standpoint, it, it depends on the position that you're hiring for. Um, a very senior level salesperson, I would love that they would have some relevant experience in my space, you know, uh, that matters. Uh, for entry level salespeople, it is about those four things I talked about. It's, it's intelligence, work ethic, character, uh, toler tolerability, <laughs> you, you know, so, but at the enterprise level where, where we're talking about here, it, it is about experience and, and, you know, what's their process, how do, they, how do they close deals, can they explain that to you, do they bring a book of business uh, with them to the, to the opportunity? Does that answer your question? It, it basically does, okay. yeah. I know there's a balance. Yeah. What about, um, so the environment I'm in is more of like a, like a self-selection with a mentor. Um, you're put in the role, um, you're told these, these things you need to do. Um, you're not giving a particular mentor, but you know the people that are around you have experience and, and everything like that. Um, so it's sort of your job to go and you know reach out to them and, now being sort of you know in the role longer, I'm seeing that you know, some of the newer guys you know will reach out to you for certain things. Um, so I have a responsibility to, to teach them, uh, but I'm not particularly a mentor. You know I'm yeah, you know an inside sales guy just doing my job. But uh, what do you think of sort of that self selection where you know if they're going to need help, they're going to reach out to the people they feel most comfortable to you know asking that. Um, I might be for one area of the business, but. You know, another you know, part of sales, I might not be the best. Can I ask just, are you in a large organization or a small organization? Uh, commercial, commercial organization, so 4,000. Okay. But so pretty big. Yeah. I, I mean, it's good that they're, they're promoting it, the, the mentor, mentoring, um, but stuff like that, if not organized, you're relying on an individual who's a brand new person you know, in your case, it might be their entry level person, maybe a recent graduate, <clears throat> first or second uh, job out of college, and you're assuming that they're gonna have the confidence and the wherewithal and the smarts to identify the best performers on the team and seek them out proactively. Um, it may happen, it may not happen. I prefer to make sure it happens by, by dividing the responsibility, like, like um, the woman in the back described, amongst the people who are most qualified to own that <clears throat> responsibility regardless of their approachability. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I actually want to ask, you know, just coming back to one point, is kind of the whole, uh, what, what do you call it, the uh, dog-eat-dog -dog world? Because mm -hmm. I see this a lot in a lot of sales organizations where it's you know, ultra-aggressive, ultra-competitive, which you want to a certain extent, but you can definitely go overboard. So how do you kind of maintain the balance of you know, having a competitive environment are thriving off of the competition but not <clears throat> trying to undermine each other yeah I, I think I talking a lot about culture and and you know love and affection I'm not gonna have us all hold hands and sing kumbaya at the end of the meeting today um, I, I just feel like well, you know, we've done it in the past but you know, so, well, no, so that's, not, not, no, that's what you guys get up to I'll, I'll take part in that that's fine <laughs> I'm into it so um, my, my point is competition is great and it, it's what moves a sales back <coughs> forward. So you have to have checks and balances to make sure that the, comp the, the competition is offset by something peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, some peer-to-peer positivity, right? So 
one thing that's sorely missing in B2B sales communities is peer-to-peer -peer recognition, right? right? So you've got a very competitive environment. You've hired people that want to win. They're beating each other. They're talking smack about it. Uh, but you've also got a peer-to-peer -peer recognition system in place. And I'll, I'll give you our example. We use, does anyone else use Slack for their, yeah. A lot, a lot of yeah, Slack. All right, so everybody, yeah, all right. So we use Slack for our internal communications. And what we did is we, we integrated, this is how easy it was. I did the integration, which normally my computer would melt if I tried something like that. But um, we integrated with a, a service called Bonusly, which is, okay, yeah, yeah it, it's a cool company. Uh, and what that allows us to do is um, every employee in the company is given, what, a $10 budget monthly? Um, a $10 budget. And they need to use that $10 budget to thank coworkers via our corporate messaging for behavior that maps to one of our core values of respect, engage, and perform. So it, it's awesome. We have, this, we have this thanks group in Slack, and you get updates on it, and it's just people who compete day to day, uh, thanking one another for, you know, um, uh, you know uh, Matt thanking John because he noticed that Matt went over, and to, your, to your point, Jeremy, Matt went over and helped out the new guy because uh, he could tell that he was struggling with something. Sure. Hashtag respect. They have to put, they actually have to physically write the core value in there that that individual um, has, has, um, has demonstrated. And then the managers have much larger budgets, but they still are required to, to reinforce the, the core value there. So I guess the, the counterbalance is what you need to look for. Let them compete. Let them say whatever they want, but also require them to thank one another periodically. I like that. And also, the, you know, what I've seen a lot is just, trying to have or try to build like team oriented you know, bonuses or spiffs or something like that so everyone's kind of you know trying to pump each other out and trying to yeah. collaborate with each other we uh, the guy uh, the guy that runs our our team of SDRs um, he started doing PTO team contests okay oh my god like you've never seen people go more psycho about a half day off <laughs> um, it was awesome you know, uh, but but at the end you see one guy, one guy thanks the other team for a good competition or whatever and its performance and stuff like that. So whatever you need to do, you got to keep it interesting. You got to diversify. And I know um, gamification is is a huge right. thing. Um, there's tools that can help you within your CRM um, to, to facilitate that kind of stuff. But yeah. How about the how about the fun side of it, right? So you, know, you recognize people, but if, what have you seen? work really well from like a recognition standpoint as well as what a good way is just blowing off steam with yeah. the team I'm, I'm partial to alcohol fueled bowling okay. um, <laughs> big ball not candle pin yeah. which is a regional thing which is garbage um, <laughs> what, what a candle pin it's little balls and it's like I don't even know how many pins it looks like 50 you get one on every frame it sucks um, so I'm going to answer the question in more detail. But <laughs> sure. I'm but, but so we're, yeah, I, I think uh, we're definitely agreeing. So right. Candle pin, not Out. real bowl. Terrible. Um, offense to any candle pin bowlers, but you guys should be. For our worldwide <laughs> audience, there may be like one Get or two. All right. all right. Remember, we're all from the South Beach. Uh oh. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm not. There you go. <laughs> should I be running for a door? Candle pins for cash? Yes. Come on. <laughs> all right, so I want you to have value. If you work for my company, I want you to come back to work tomorrow and the next day. I thought everything you said was very good. I'm getting, I'm learning a lot. But so I think of like WGBH, value, channel two, like people that value their work. Because once everybody in this room starts making money, then you come to work because you like your work, you value your work. So when I was starting out, when I was 20, 25 years old, they gave out index cards at these meetings, at these sales meetings. They would give a bunch of stack of index cards, and you wrote what you were going to do in 25 years, so you minded your own business. You learned to mind your business. And what I learned in the next 20 years, 25 years, was do like five things a day. Make five emails, make five phone calls, read five newspaper articles, and write five correspondences, and you're going to make money. Consistency is everything. Yeah. I agree. I mean, yep. figure out what, figure out what your, what your routine is, and you.
you see it consistently make you better, make you more money, make you more successful, make you make you like your job more. I'm, I'm all for it. It's actually a good good point of yeah. point of year to kind of maybe get those habits. It was actually just kind of off topic, but uh, I was listening to a podcast recently where they talked about this concept of mini habits. So don't try to do the big thing. Just do one thing that's easy to accomplish and then build over time. So it's kind of an interesting perspective. Thanks, Joe, for the comments. Uh, but yeah, I think we were talking about fun. Fun. And, and not doing candle pin bowl. No candle pin. Um, I, I think you can have, I mean, you should celebrate everything. I mean, that's my personality uh, anyways, but um, you, should, you should make a big deal around people's success, uh, especially if you're in a leadership role, if you own talent in your organization and, and somebody advances to the next step or they, they get promoted, um, everybody should be thanking them and, and congratulating them and, and stuff like that. Uh, contests we already talked about, um, drunk bowling we talked about, we're doing ours on Friday. Um, I'm there. It's an open invitation. Jillian's, three o'clock. How, how do you make a big deal about promotions or whatever is happening in your organization if it doesn't naturally Meaning the, the thank you or the promotion? <laughs> no, the like celebration, making a big deal of the excitement. Would you be talking about maybe a person that people aren't excited that they got promoted? No, just in general. Like, okay. actually, we work in a small company, so if it's not like a thing where we celebrate it, it's not like the Well, in, in a situation like yours where it's, yeah, no, it totally does, yeah. it totally does. And I think in a situation like yours where it's not happening naturally, um, somebody, maybe it's you, is gonna do it. And you might send a mass email out to a team saying, hey, I just want to take a minute to thank Ben or congratulate Ben. I don't know if anyone knows, but he just got a big promotion. Um, you might ruffle some feathers from people that probably should have sent that email or, or celebrated somebody. Um, but you know that that's what it takes because culturally that that is not part of what your company is all about right now that doesn't mean it, it can never be part of what your company is all about but a lot of times it takes someone that isn't uh, in the c-suite and maybe you are I, I, I don't know but you know isn't in this in the in the c-suite to, to say this is what we do it takes somebody that is doing the job to take it upon themselves to, to make that sort of stuff happen. Yeah. So I wish I wish I had a you know a way to make it happen, but I, I would say just do it. Yeah, I mean it, it actually speaks to. Uh, I was helping a company out, and they had <coughs> the, the, it was the classic non-sales culture. Yeah. They, the, they just took for granted that they had salespeople and that they sold stuff, but there's no recognition. So I did one thing to try and change it. So. I, Every week, at the end of the week, I'd do a, a weekly wins email. Went out to essentially the entire company. That's exactly what I did in this situation. And it, it worked like a charm. Like people were starting to like get, get excited about it. And it just it started to build up. But if you're able to just do one thing, again, just you know, a mini habit, or just like a mini thing that you do, eventually it starts to build over time. People get excited about it and say, oh, well, I did this. Why, why wasn't I in that? And starts to you know, almost create a culture without having one been in place to start. I think leadership needs to get out of the way too. In, in, in my business, uh, I was. I didn't tell them that. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, this will be recorded, so send this part to them. <laughs> that that wasn't happening enough in my business. It wasn't formalized. It was when I remembered to do it because my ego was telling me that I needed to be the one that sent the thanks out, and now it's not my job. I don't do it, I, but I see it, and I make sure I, I go and, and congratulate that person when I see it, but that, that's a problem a lot too, where executives and leadership thinks that they're the ones that need to own that, and then they don't do it. Yeah, it's kind of funny, I mean, you, you assume that you should own everything, but yeah. in reality, a lot of these things that work really well should yeah. be done organically, and try to encourage people to have these ideas and to, and to see if they spread. Yeah, the less I'm involved with, the more my company grows. So, sorry to discredit your speaker right okay, now. Okay. Let, lesson learned. Uh, yeah. Less of Peter, more, more of uh, more of Ed. I don't want that. <laughs>
<laughs> I didn't start that. We just implemented Slack too, so I think that'll help getting everyone involved as we're growing yeah. for everyone to feel like they have a voice and yeah. talk about whatever. And find like one thing that you can all agree should be celebrated. Like, okay, so when someone wins a deal, that's an obvious like, start. Yep. Yeah. But then you can like maybe find other things, like you know, great a great call which advanced the deal, or just trying to find like other ways of getting people pumped up. Yep. It was a question back there. Yeah. Um, in the past, that we're going to sell the where you have a top performer, but it might not be the best ambassador of culture and value that you're really setting. So how do you? Personally, yeah, it, it, that's pretty interesting because I've seen just that. But the question was, when you have a top performer, how are you kind of integrating this top performer into what you're trying to do from a culture perspective? Is that yeah? yeah. yeah. More specific, if they're like maybe a jerk. Example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, jerk. I, I, I got you. Um, I'll tell you what I do. I'm not, not advocating this for anyone else, but it works for me, right? I, we have our core values, and the, the first one, I said it, I'll say it again, it's respect, right? You, you, know, you get respect before you show it. You respect your colleagues, your boss, your customers, your prospects, anyone you engage with, you're just respectful. Um, for me, regardless of your individual performance, that is a deal breaker. You get one warning that you're not towing the line from a respect standpoint, and the next time, you, you don't work there anymore. Um, somebody's gotta quantify this, someone's gotta do a study on it, but I would love to know uh, what the relationship between the, the, the person you're talking about, the value they bring to the organization, how does their behavior outside of that value, how much does it detract from the rest of the organization? And I would bet that the number's staggering. Um, and that, that the, the loss in productivity from people sitting and saying, what a, you know, Pete sucks, I, I can't stand him, he's a jerk, uh, far outweighs the revenue that, that that top performer is bringing in. But it's hard, it's hard to, people don't like to fire people. And we're, and we're Massachusetts, it's a right to work state. I mean, you can get rid of somebody. You know? It's hard, but you gotta do it. Yeah. So don't keep on. Don't keep the jerks in your company. Yeah. Salient, salient lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, but most management won't do that if the jerks are performing. Yeah. That's really the problem. Yeah. It's, a, it's a cultural issue. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's part true. of the culture. You know, you allow that as an organization um, because you didn't put an emphasis on the culture of your sales team and what they're all about. Question here from Mike, but I'll get to you. So soon. back to the, the sales culture in a core, from the core concept. So, Mark, you mentioned the big O database application company, and yeah, I, I don't know. The, I don't know what I, I don't the know what you're talking about either. But I made a lot of money there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. But everybody kind of knows their culture, it, whether whether they're inside or outside of the company. And we've evolved to this much more transactional, phone-based sales world. So, to me, a lot of that culture has been lost. So how important is sales culture today externally to the buying audience? And how do you communicate your culture as a value to the buying audience as a competitive differentiator? Does it even matter anymore? Uh, I, I like that a lot because you know, talking about sales culture, but it also has to, you almost want to reflect the outside organization as well. Yeah, I, I don't, you, so I think, let's think of a really bad analogy, right? Um, <laughs> Popcorn bowl. No, that, that was terrible. Um, was rather, sorry. Um, I, I think it doesn't matter whether or not we're, we're evolving into that transactional inside sales model. Um, you, these people are still the first point of live contact uh, for an organization. You know? and, and I'll argue with anybody in here, you still gotta talk to people in order pro to progress deals forward. You can't just create a relationship and create a buyer through email. If, you're, if your average ticket is anywhere north of 1500 bucks <laughs> annually. Um, so I, I would argue that it's even more important now because of where we are, because to forget about it, right, like everybody is doing in this more transactional inside sales model, um, to forget about it puts you in with everybody else. <laughs> 
So be the company whose people represent them in a more positive way. Be the company that puts an emphasis on talking to your salespeople about, you know, how do you think your behavior uh, reflects on the organization? How you phrase that question, how you overcome that objection, how you, uh, you, you structure your, um, your calling rhythm and the emails, the number of emails that you're sending to a prospective client, how does that reflect on the personality and the culture of our organization? And, and it's a lost art. Um, it's why we're still in business, because we do it really well. Um, and and you know, I, I think it's more important than ever to make sure that these t sales teams that you're describing uh, get educated and understand that it isn't transactional. Take that word out of their, their vernacular. Don't let them call themselves transactional. Don't call your company transactional because there's a person at the end of that transaction. That's a good point. I mean, you hear that word transactional thrown around a lot, but in reality, I mean, you're still trying to build a relationship, you're trying to convey value yeah. and act on your, your values as well as a sales professional. Um, to that point, I would say, what, what's the B2B version of Yelp G2 Crowd? I have no idea. I think that's what it's called. But if you go on G2 Crowd, you can see countless reviews from companies where that they have instilled that type of positive culture. Get the light glass shut up. Door. Yeah, <laughs> not glass doors for yeah, if you're looking for a uh, job door, opportunity. Second, we'll, we'll tell you the same thing. Yeah, but so in the in the organizations that haven't instilled that, even if they're having that transactional churn and burn type model, then the, their customers will will start to research and find out about it, and then you'll start to see that that start to slope off. We've seen it with plenty of companies. It is, it is kind of interesting how like, a lot of these types of reviews, so I you think about Glassdoor, for example, yep. right, or like employee reviews of their own companies. And you know, there, there is a correlation, right, you know, both from the outside perspective customers, as well as what employees are saying, in terms of what that organization is able to do, and the success that, from an organization perspective of what you can achieve. Well, if your employees kind of hate your organization, yeah. well, that's what's going to be reflected. That's going to be reflected outside to your customers as well. Yeah, I had to, when I was in high school, I played uh, freshman lacrosse. And this is a good story. <laughs> dumb tales into that. Um, and I was the backup goalie on the freshman lacrosse team. You know, that's literally like being a mascot. It's not a, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a, a glamour position. Uh, and every year, the town, all the sports, the people that played sports had to go around. It was called Save Our Sports, you know one of the more affluent towns in the state, we had to save our sports. It's like, all right, whatever. Um, so we had to go door to door and ask for donations to save our sports teams, right? So I hated my sports team. I hated the coach. I subsequently got kicked off the team for skipping practice and just standing out in front of the school and he drove by and kicked me off the team. But, um, you know, the, the culture that they created is that everybody was saying the same thing and I was somebody that hated this organization that I was representing and I did a terrible job at donating. You know, I got the 10 bucks from my mom, and that's what I turned in at the end of the donation period. And I walked around and probably bored my neighbors to tears. You know, so it, it's, it's, it's a story that, that maps to that point. If you don't care about what you're doing, if you don't care about the culture you're involved in or immersed in, if you don't want to represent it well, you don't. None of us are above that. I think a lot of people think they are. You can't fake it. Yeah. And I, want to leave, I was thinking about leaving on that, but I want to ask you one last question before we go for the evening. You know, we talk a lot about culture and all that. Has there been a book that you've read or a blog, just something, maybe a video that's really inspired you recently yeah. around culture or just really just inspiration in general? Yeah. So I'm, I'm like, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm, I'm clearly a player in the space. So I got an advanced copy of um, the Sales Development Playbook from Trish Bertuzzi, who's here tonight. Um, hey, Trish. Let's see the book. She's conveniently. <laughs> and the, the book is there. That's <laughs> great. Uh, We're looking forward to that. So Tr Trish and I are, are, are good friends. We play a lot of golf together. We've done a lot of work together over the years. And, and somebody's, you know, what was inspiring to me is that I read the book. And it, it really mapped to what our outsourcing business has been about for all these years. So it, it's nice to see somebody really um, identifying kind of the six key areas that, it, that the six key pillars of successful sales development. Um, easy read, very kind of, I guess the word for me would be um, reaffirming of what we've been doing all these years. So that's the best book I've read, I've read lately. And then the one, the one you mentioned earlier, um, Sales Management Simplified. Simplified. 
I might is, find. Yeah, it's another easy read. Lots of good humor in there. Um, so those two. So so two good reads. Yeah. You know, keeping score. Uh, Trisha's book, the sales development playbook, yep. and Mike Weinberg's book, uh, New Sales Management Simplified. Uh, I just want to give a round of applause. Let's give it up. Really appreciate it. Uh, just a, a few key announcements uh, after this. You can obviously mill around for a bit. We still have some more beer and stuff. But we are having our next event uh, here. It's February 9th. So every second Tuesday of the month will be the Boston Enterprise Sales Meetup. This is our new home. So thank you again to Inside Squared for being such a gracious host and having our community here on a month by month basis. Our next speaker is Liz Kane, who is worldwide director of business development for NetSuite. So, and I've heard her speak. She's fabulous. We're going to be talking. She has a mentor program too. And she has a, thank you. And she has a mentor program and I uh, just, uh, Huh? She into candlestick bowling? I think she is in, in the candlestick bowling, so that's a, that might be a minus, but uh, <laughs> she's awesome in every other respect. Uh, so definitely sign up for that. Uh, one of the things that we're starting to institute is we just want to make sure people do come to the event. So we're asking people to pay a nominal fee uh, just to RSVP to the event. Uh, it's $10, it's not a lot, and we're doing beer and food and all that. Uh, hope you still actually sign up and attend uh, because month over month we're just going to have continue to have really great speakers like Peter and continue to just have a lot of great content month after month. So that's it. Thank you again for supporting the community and being out here tonight and obviously Peter will be here to answer any questions that you may have and thank you again. But just to go a round of applause. Just <laughs>